I had them all down before I dialed up How they came and they on top and I'm a mile up All right, folks, welcome. This is Jackie Lukeman. And I'm Uncle Baba. And welcome to another episode of the Cypher and Lukeman Nation. The most dangerous show on social media. <laughs> Maybe not the most technical, <laughs> but damn sure the most dangerous. Yeah, we had some weird technical glitch that we just figured out. I don't know what happened, but yeah, we're, we're so glad you're here. And and look, what do we always say? But, this is what happens when, hey, when you don't have that CNN money, yep. when you've got that independent journalist money. And we don't have <laughs> and an intern. No interns. No, just our nope. intern is asleep upstairs on the bed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Brewski, yep. Brewski, the Luke Mons intern. Hmm. Yep. But hey, look, we have not done a cipher in a while. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, you're dealing with two um, trying to be tech savvy Gen Xers. <laughs> so, you know. Is that what we are? We are Generation X. Okay. Yep. Man, I remember when Gen X was edgy and frightening. The and, MTV generation. And, oh, remember? my God. Now I have that. arthritis and I'm, it's almost my bedtime. It's not even That's special pretty anymore. <laughs> yep. So, Baba, here we are again in the Cypher and Luke Mon Nation. Yes, yes. And it has been a while since we have done one of these folks, and we appreciate you, um, you know, just kind of hanging out with us, sticking with us. And we we decided, you know, we can't take for granted that everybody who hangs out with us over on Luke Mon Nation hangs out with us on Black Power Media, and everybody who hangs out with us on Black Power Media always hangs out with us on Luke Mon exactly, Nation. Exactly. So, you know, we we... We want to make sure that we hit all our folks and that we cross pollinate because, mm. you know, we like cross pollination. Yep. It's good for the environment. Yep. Yep. So, you know, here we are. Yep. And um, so, yeah. So, again, um, let's get this housekeeping out of the way again. <laughs> um, and you, and um, if you're in the audience, man, let us know if, you, if we're having any sound problems or anything like that. Just be try to be our eyes and ears for us, please. You know, so. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, like, subscribe, uh, join, hit the uh, notification bell. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, uh, invite your friends, your enemies, um, just, you know, y'all know the drill. Y'all been yes. around for a while. So, you know, we're just trying to, um, introduce the Luke My Nation experience to, um, your friends and yeah. Something and even like people you don't like, especially especially people you don't people like people you don't like. Yeah, especially them. Because <laughs> they're the ones who need the most empathy. They they do. They do. Yep. Give them the excuse to be even madder. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And and can we be honest? Can what? we just be honest with yeah. our folks? It's nice to have, you know, to, to keep our own space. Cause sometimes, you know, we say stuff mm -hmm. that not everybody can do. <laughs> so you know, we we recognize that that our sensibilities are different from other folks. Y'all know how we rock over here. What she wanted um, to say is, you know, sometimes we can't we can't get loose like we want to. So, so yeah. we can get real loose and funky in all kinds yeah. of you know all kinds of ways here over in Luke Monet. Not saying that we can't on Black Power Media. It's just you know we have time constraints. And, you know, we want to make sure that we get the channel off to a good, solid start yes. before we start truly terrifying people with the full Luke Mon Nation experience. That's why you come over here. Anyway. Yep. So now that that's out of the way. Now that that's all out of the way. Listen. Oh, he hopped off. I guess we're talking tonight about um, someone who I actually just learned about very recently. Mm. Um, like, honestly, when I... Uh, met Dr. Sharice Burden Stelly. Right. Um, and I learned about him because, you know, she, uh, uh, I think she wrote the foreword to a new book about him. Mm -hmm. And then I found out there was a previous book written about mm -hmm. him. So there's this two volume massive work right. about this uh, giant of black radical thought okay. and, and action that I'd never heard of. Right, right, right. And that's Hubert Harrison. And I think it's important to talk about uh, Hubert Harrison because like so many of our, um, our historical figures, our leaders, you know, they're complex people. Yeah. And, and there are parts of the story that people might not want to dig into but are very important. Mm -hmm. and, and there's always still so much to learn. Mm -hmm. So tonight, we are really, really pleased uh, to 
have with us and let me have him. He's already smiling because I'm so excited. What's going on, Dr. Roan Frazier? Yes, yes. Dr. Roan. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you, Jackie. Thank, thank you, you. Our dudes. Thank you for supporting me at the church, the place where we met, Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. Thank you for supporting my liberation theology class, which was uh, a conception of another member, Crystal Lewis. I want to thank Crystal Lewis for proposing that, and I want to thank you for inviting me to talk about Hubert Harrison, this big book, because this is important, Jackie and Abdus, because how our experience is interpreted, you know? Mm -hmm. This is something that Hubert Harrison said in pieces that he wrote, in articles that he wrote. Too often, he said, we get a white lens, we get the white view. He was talking about the curriculum at HBCUs. Mm, uh, he wow. didn't call it, he called them Negro colleges. In right, his right. language, we call them HBCUs now, but at the time he was writing, he called them. And he said too much of the curriculum has been told from a white point of view. Mm. So I still think we need to study the white point of view, not to believe it or internalize it, but to mm -hmm. see exactly how it's a white point of view. And I encourage everyone to read this long tome um, because it still gives you an idea of what journalism is, what you, Abduce, do when you talk about your experience in the nation, what yeah. you, Jackie, do when you talk about your experience in independent media, working um, with Sputnik Radio and comparing that to the mainstream that we get. Well, what Hubert Harrison did in his whole life was the kind of independent journalism in the Negro World newspaper. Mm. But the way he his life was told ultimately is still from a white point of view. That doesn't mean we shouldn't know it. We should read it, but still understand that it's not exactly from his perspective. And that's what makes um, the writing interesting. That's mm -hmm. what makes the struggle that we are working for, that you work for on Sputnik Radio real. The fact that we have still subconsciously been taught the wrong information about who we are and the agency we have. It's not completely, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh -huh. But you still should learn um, um, how Hubert Harrison's life was still told from a white point of view. Um, but I still respect Jeffrey Perry. Jeffrey Perry gave me um, a copy of the work he did of Hubert Harrison's writings. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I respect him and the labor of love that he spent his life in. But after reading the book, um, there were some parts of the book, parts of his life uh, that was told from a white point of view and should really be told from the perspective of people within the organization that supported Hubert Harrison, hmm. which was UNIA. Well, Dr. Major, um, and, and, thank, and, and thank you for coming on. You know, um, I, I got to say, to the audience out there, like, you know, um, there's a lot that, uh, there's a lot of, of, of people that um, contributed to Luke My Nation, our development and all those things. And Dr. Faye, you are one of them. I mean, you know, we, we're not just here because we know so much. Mm -hmm. We were here because we met people like you and um, um, who, who, you know, we tend, attended your liberation classes and everything. So trust me, the Luke Mines, um, you know, we, we we've been blessed to have some powerful people um, mm -hmm. in our circle. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to um, say to you, um, ask you, um, Dr. Frazier, is when you say from a white perspective, you know, um, here I am as a layman. What did, what do you mean by that, and how and why why would that be a problem? Oh, I mean, when I say from a white perspective, I mean, I know Jeffrey Perry means well, and again to know about Hubert Harrison, you must read Jeffrey Perry. He has become the authority. Mm. He has studied him and know every detail. However, what I mean by a white perspective is in the 12th chapter, in this second volume, he has a 12th chapter called The Period of Garvey's Arrest. Mm. And the reason I say from a white point of view is because most of the sources that Perry is telling the story of Garvey's arrest from is from reports from agents, government agents, who already have a bent to try and criminalize Garvey. So that is what I mean. And at this time, J. Edgar Hoover is taking the helm of the Bureau of Investigation. And he's looking to, like he did with Jack Johnson, 
um, find something, find some law. And he had to find and look hard um, to criminalize Marcus Garvey with, to put everything in context for our listeners. Garvey was Harrison's biggest employer. Um, but Perry writes that what Garvey did was take Harrison's model that Harrison was doing before um, Garvey came to Harlem and make great financial profit from it and maintain ownership of it. Um, and so what is clear in the book, Abdus and Jackie, is that there is some intellectual jealousy that Harrison has of Garvey. But mm-hmm. one thing that can't be, not, can't be denied is the foundation that 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 economic foundation Garvey provided for Harrison. I think his salary was something like thirty dollars a month, which is the most he ever got, really, um, as working as a writer, um, doing independent journalism, and that's what really motivates me. I'm motivated by Jackie's work every day, listening to her and Sean Blackman on By Any Means Necessary, mm-hmm. and I always think of it in terms of what Harrison was doing with Garvey in that one, two, three year time period Mm. between 1919 and 1921. Those three years were a powerhouse for independent black journalism that changed so many people's lives. You know, Tony Martin writes about Ho Chi Minh came came to the United States looking for where Garvey's office is because he read the Negro World newspaper. Wow. Wow. Um, and it, his amazing. paper got on oh, yeah. His paper. I mean, hold, on. Hold, hold on for a second, right there. That's some deep stuff, right there. Yes. Yes. The fact that Ho Chi Minh yeah. came to Harlem, yes, and said, "Where is Marcus Garvey's office? Right. Because I want to meet this man whose paper I read that is full of information about black people right. in the United States right. and the diaspora." Yeah. Ho Chi Minh read news about us. So we always bring up this point, y'all. And I don't think we will ever stop bringing it up. If our ideological teachers were internationalists and they understood the importance, so much so that Ho Chi Minh would come to a whole nother country and be like, where is the dude who writes this stuff about Black folks that I need to meet him? What is our problem with expressing and being in solidarity with not only Africans throughout the diaspora, but other working class, poor and oppressed people around the world. What's our problem? Yeah, okay, that's my last aside. Let me go, please go, please go ahead. Sorry about the interruption. No, interru- that was a, along with the flow of Abduce's question. So uh, the reason it was so attractive, Jackie, to your point to Ho Chi Minh was because it was not written from a white point of view. It was not mm-hmm. written from the government agents that were trying to criminalize Garvey. And that was the only disappointing, not one, but maybe five. But again, the, the amount of knowledge Perry gives the individual, that he gives the reader about the content of what Harrison said must be read. He writes this mm-hmm. article, it's probably one of my top four articles by Hubert Harrison called Just Crabs, where he's wow. talking about how the Socialist Party um, basically uses their money to divide the Negroes against each other. And so Harrison says at the end of this article, quit being just crabs. He's talking specifically about A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen. Um, But the way that um, his life turns out, Jackie and Abdus, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, he becomes a kind of informant, Harrison does, against Garvey and the UNIA. So although in 1920, he critiques Chandler, Owen, and A. Philip Randolph, by the end of 1922, he's doing the same thing when he writes to the New York World Editor comparing the UNIA to the Klan. And he's subtly trying to get money um, from them, trying to have them employ him. They don't employ him the way that Garvey does. He'll never find that kind of employment to his death. Uh, But um, he still writes to them and I think what he saw in choosing to do that was how the tide was really turning against Garvey. And he made the choice that he might as well go with that tide, you know, go with that tide against Garvey. But and and so he succumbs to a white point of view to Abduce's question, even though he writes against that very strongly 
by the second year of writing for it, he 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 succumbs to the white point of view. Harry Hubert Harrison does. So so when you say Dr. Frazier that he that that Harrison succumbs to the white point of view, what is it? And and and, and that the tide was turning and he succumbed to this pressure. What was the pressure? Was the pressure of the the black intelligentsia that had fallen out with Garvey? Yes, was exactly. It, was it the FBI that was clearly after Garvey? Yes. Um, you know, pretty much the the whole uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, Garvey was his first assignment as an FBI agent. Absolutely. Period. Uh, so you know what what were the pressures that Harrison succumbed to? That that made him feel like he needed to, you know, do what he did ultimately and turn against Garvey. Definitely, those two factors, Jackie, that you said, the black intelligentsia. Uh, you had Tony Martin says it's uh, Du Bois that writes a letter to the Secretary of State, but that didn't come until 1923. Mm -hmm. Also, of the intelligentsia, you had Cyril Briggs, and I think one of the gems that I learned from Jeffrey Perry is that Cyril Briggs. His letters, he was the one who told the government, if you want to get him on any charge, since the government was looking for something to charge him with, you should get him on a mail fraud charge. That that wow. idea came from Cyril Briggs. Wow. Which Tony Martin says also the New York district attorney, well before um, Harrison, you know, succumbed to the tide, um, the New York district attorney, his name is Edwin Kilroe. He had already got wind of what Garvey was already about and trying to send agents. Garvey writes about an assassin named George Tyler, who he said, Garvey said, was sent to him, Garvey, by Edwin Kirill to kill him. Um, this was in 1919. And one of the scenes in my play, because I'm a playwright, I write, I've written five plays. Mm -hmm. And the play I wrote, the last play I wrote is about Amy Ashwood Garvey. And there's a scene that came very vividly after a lot of study of what that kind of looked like. Amy Ashwood Garvey literally threw her body and wrestled George Tyler to the ground when he came to the UNIA office. And I want to say the latter part of 1919, they got married later that year, December um, Christmas Day of 1919, but before then, the government, to your question, um, through the district attorney and through the black intelligentsia from Du Bois and from really Cyril Briggs, mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey Perry does a masterful job of giving you some of the elements in both, but in certain ways, he doesn't explain the deeper context of the neo-colonialism that was happening. And what I mean by that is how um, black agents were around Garvey who were hired hands. You know, there were certain aspects of the Garvey movement Perry discussed that could have used more of Garvey's interpretation. And we have to trust what Garvey said. And that's how I'm coming to reading Hubert Harrison. If we really examine what Garvey said himself, um, we should see the holes in some of what Perry says. Uh, Dr. Frazier, I wanted to, um, for the sake of time, I wanted to get into some of the points um, in Perry's biography. Um, let's let's deal with the um, the introduction uh, by quoting Eugene O'Neill saying intentional uplift amounts to a dam. What does that mean? It means it doesn't, he's saying it doesn't amount to anything. It was kind of a tete-a-tete -tete between um, Eugene O'Neill and Hubert Harrison, who had reviewed his play, The Emperor Jones, favorably, and Eugene O'Neill wrote him, thanking him for his review. And there was kind of a mutual disdain, you could tell, about Garvey, even though Garvey was employing Harrison. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was an interesting choice Perry made of, of having Eugene O'Neill saying intentional uplift amounts to a dam, because Harrison did not really believe that. He was talking about the necessity, a lot of his early Negro world articles was about the necessity for intentional uplift because we live in a white world. Our mm -hmm. subconscious is trained to think at, like a white supremacist mm -hmm. and to disparage everything black. So the Negro world provided the very necessary intentional uplift. Eugene O'Neill's point was anytime you're making too much of an effort to uplift any group, 
it's not going to mean anything. Mm -hmm. And that's something that was totally um, at odds, totally against with what the Negro World newspaper was about. Hmm. That that is really interesting yes. um, nuance. That world that that word that so many people don't like, but is extremely right. extremely important. Yes. And and I think it's some of that kind of relational nuance and the political nuance that might be kind of the reason why some of these points that you raised may be missing in Perry's um, uh, interpretation of some of Garvey's letters because. You know, he says that the Garvey family, his when his, uh, I'm sorry, the Harrison family, yes. when Harrison's children were still alive, um, they gave him Harrison's letters, all of his stuff, and said, look, do with this what you want. And there is actually an enormous collection of Hubert Harrison's uh, works, his letters, his memoirs, you know, all his diaries at, I think, the university, uh, at uh, Columbia <laughs> University. Yes. And I think there's a there's a link to it. And before this show ends, I'm going to look for it and see if I can grab it and pop it into the chat for you all. Um, but, but you mentioned that there's a lot in this book about the relationship between Hubert Harrison and Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. and in particular, the UNIA and the organization of Harrison's that preceded, that kind of literally the UNIA was built off of. So um, th there's a point that you make about the, the four, in the fourth chapter, incompletely interpreting why the UNIA, UNIA travel to Liberia failed. Yeah. And, and, and then there's the issue of uh, the correct Garvey aesthetic. Yeah. Wrap yeah. that into what that means in the context of Harrison's organization <laughs> Yes. UNIA that came after it, and and was there tension between Harrison and Garvey because of yes. uh, of that that transition? Yes, there's no doubt. Intellectual jealousy was going on, um, and it was clear that Hubert Harrison was intellectually jealous. One of the men that Harrison wrote about, Perry quoted a letter from him. His name is escaping me now, but he called Hubert Harrison Garvey's bitterest enemy, and this is while. Harrison was still wow. working for Garvey. Um, but I believe there's something to be said, Jackie and Abdus, about the respect that Garvey had for Harrison's wow. writing. Um, it's immense. And when you read it, when you read his critiques, when you read um, his clear, I think if I could put it into one sentence before I answer your question, um, one sentence that encapsulates the power of Hubert Harrison's writer writing that Garvey was aware of. It is, show me whose bread you eat and I'll tell you whose song you sing. Oh. It's mm -hmm. clear that from what Harrison said that in that Just Crabs article. Um, it's clear that Marcus Garvey knew like nobody else, Harrison could show to the reader like Ho Chi Minh, to the reader like those um, Jomo Kenyatta, to the reader like those in South Africa. He could show like nobody else um, the bread that people eat and how the reason they eat the white capitalist bread is the reason they sing their song. Oh, and okay. But he wrote it in a way where you want to get your own bread. You know, Billie Holiday's song, God Bless the Child That Has His Own, Garvey yeah. demonstrated that, Harrison explained that. Mm -hmm. And the explanation made people move. To your question about Liberia, um, the way, so the Liberia trip failed. Tony Martin is really the first one to write about this, but P P Perry is the second. According to Perry's biography, because he's writing about Hubert Harrison, he will take Harrison's point of view as to why the Liberia trip failed and just leave it alone. And that point of view is the reason the UNI trip to Liberia failed is because of Garvey's blabbing, his lecturing. When when you really study, it's it, it's the lecturing that caused the whole UNIA to form. Mm -hmm. So what Perry misses in just quoting Harrison and leaving that for the reader as to the only reason why the UNI trip failed was the relationship that certain capitalists had with Liberia, specifically mm. um, 
Firestone, Harvey Firestone. Okay. Right. Um, Tony Martin does a better job of explaining that the Liberia trip failed and Garvey himself. The Liberia trip failed because Harvey Firestone made very clear to the Liberian government, you let Garvey in and you can forget our business relationship. So that needed to be put in when he talks about Liberia, when Perry talks about Liberia, that whole context, that's what I mean by the context. He needed to have a wider context to explain that it wasn't just Garvey's lecturing and blabbing <laughs> that caused the Liberia trip to fail. It was the greater context of neo-colonialism where, you know, Firestone was in control of that Liberian government. And they, Arthur Barclay is his name. Garvey names the prime minister of Liberia who denied him and the UNIA entry, Arthur Barclay. And Arthur Barclay was somebody who was clearly paid under the economic control of Harvey Firestone, of the Firestone rubber, because, you know, that was the most lucrative export for Liberia at that time in the 20s. So just a greater context um, about the reason the Liberia trip failed um, was why was why a greater context was needed from Perry. You had what was your next question or point about the book about the uh, the aesthetics? The yeah, aesthetics. The, 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 the correct Garvey aesthetic. Garvey aesthetic. We yeah. need this today, and you yeah. do it already. What in the way that you talk about Black Panther, Jackie and mm -hmm. Abdul, you're mm -hmm. you already have that aesthetic. It's just like for example, Black Panther, the film, in my opinion was great. However, at the end, it didn't question the role of that white intelligence officer mm. who's seen as the friend of Wakanda, who's mm -hmm. seen as somebody Wakanda should trust. Mm -hmm. So the correct Garveyite aesthetic would say, is this historically accurate? Have we historically seen a constructive role mm -hmm. of a U.S. black or white intelligence officer working harmoniously um, <laughs> with an African self-determining government? Have we ever right. seen that? So mm -hmm. that's the correct Garveyite aesthetic that's used to describe the artistic standard of films. In Perry's biography, I think Perry's brilliance, and I'm so glad he put it in, was when he quoted Tony Martin saying, the correct Garveyite aesthetic was a letter to the editor to the Negro world. A woman named Mrs. Corby had read an article that Hubert Harrison wrote praising, it was the review Harrison wrote praising the Emperor Jones. And she said, the only reason he's praising it is because it, the play turned film, has become a commercial success because it shows black people ignorant. And if Harrison is praising it, um, then he is really under their control. He is proof that some of some of us intelligence and brains for some of us means we're going in the wrong direction. And what Perry does is he quotes Tony Martin saying, this letter that this woman, Mrs. Corby writes, demonstrates the correct Garveyite aesthetic in that the great white way generally only promotes as good musicals, musicals that degrade Negro people. And the Emperor Jones is an example of that. Um, mm -hmm. Perry describes it as a play that's this kind of revenge fantasy against the Garvey movement because the Emperor Jones is about this uh, Pullman Porter turned um, ruler of a Caribbean right. island who's like a tyrant. Mm -hmm. Right. And he dies right. at the end and the audience is supposed to feel satisfied. Oh, good right. people, they got rid of this tyrant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Harrison praises it. And Mrs. Corby um, critiques Harrison harshly and Martin praises it and Martin praises that as the correct Garveyite aesthetic. And, 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 and Jeffrey Perry says, this is what made the Negro world the Negro world, that you had wow. this kind of discourse going on about what is a black aesthetic. That word is bandied around so much. I'm sure I'll do, Jackie. It means nothing, <laughs> just like white supremacy now. Mm -hmm. And then you see the people saying it and it's like, no, this is not, you know, a black aesthetic. <laughs> Just because something is. is black or people, black people are in it or mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's from that aesthetic. So I'm grateful Jeffrey Perry mentioned what artistic standard meant in the Negro World newspaper. 
you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm so glad um, that you tied it in to what we're still fighting with now. Um, uh, Jackie and I were just talking about, uh, you know, the Thomas Sowells and the Candace Owens and all, you know, still trying to fight these anti-black narratives from, uh, well, I won't put Candace Owens as intellectual, but somebody like Thomas Sowell who's passed <laughs> off as intellectual and others, you know, so that, that was a good point. But this was something, uh, Dr. Frazier, that really um, got to me, um, uh, was interesting to me, is the white people versus um, Negro, uh, the yes. white people versus Negroes, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Incredible. Incredible. That for us, yeah, please. why is that still relevant? I mean, we, we know why it's still relevant right. today, but, yes. but in this context, why is it still, why do you say it's still relevant today? Because the Negroes, Harrison's point in that article, white people versus Negroes, is why are the big Negroes, and what I mean by big are those that have a lot of power in, in their time, why are they ignoring J.A. Rogers' book from Superman to Man? And it's showing how, as a black person, you can come from being a poem porter to be an enormously influential person that can make, can be black people Superman, the way Garvey was to so many black people. Why, Harrison asks, is this being ignored? And he explains they're being ignored because of the slave psychology that so many big Negroes are still under. And he basically is saying they're paid to ignore it. And it's a lot of people today um, that we can think of. Um, Jeffrey Perry mentions intellectuals today that copy um, the dynamic between Du Bois and Spingarn, Spingarn controlling Du Bois. Mm. The, the dynamic between um, Alain Locke and Kellogg, you mm. know, and how Kellogg controlled Alain Locke and Alain Locke kind of reinterpreted the new Negro but he depoliticized it the way that Garvey and Harrison politicized the new Negro mm. and made it more palatable for a white audience. So even though he doesn't mention Locke, that white people versus Negro article in so many ways prophesies um, the behavior of Alain Locke and how they will come in and say, no, black culture is this. And what black culture is to Alain Locke is completely depoliticizing it. It has no political political ambition. It has no black nationalist ambition, but they take basically what Garvey did and just depoliticize it. Take what the Negro world did and depoliticize it. Um, so it's such a powerful article, white people versus Negroes, because for, for Harrison, that is the bigger struggle. And by Negroes, he means the big Negroes. Mm. When will that fight be? When will the big Negroes, the ones who have been designated to be the representative of for the race, when will they begin to question the assumptions that their capitalist owners have them under? It's an mm -hmm. important wow. question. Oprah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. also of uh, Tyler Perry and Lionsgate. We don't question yeah. that dynamic yeah. enough. Yes, yeah. Tyler Perry worked hard. We can say that. Yeah, he worked hard to get, yeah, he slept in the car. But he would not have had the support. He would not be as successful without the support of Lionsgate. So mm -hmm. can we ask the question, if he does something Lionsgate genuinely disapprove of content wise, will it be produced? You know, right. And the, this is this is where Hubert Harrison's writing comes through because he hits that mark and says, mm -hmm. regardless of it should be produced. And, and he's begging us, the reader, to really get back to that aesthetic that he was writing mm. with Marcus Garvey. We need to have our own standards. And the NAACP Image Awards is nice because it's recognition that allows you some coin. Nobody can turn down, nobody should turn down coin. Right. But it's still <laughs> run by the NAACP and they have That's a deep right. history with Marcus Garvey. Garvey reached out to them, Tony Martin said several times. And you know, spirit has really moved on me, Abdus and Jackie. To um to feel to feel the rejection that Garvey felt mm. when he tried to reach out to them, similar to the rejection that a um, a black man feels when trying to really make a family connection, and mm. Mm, just rejection. And so he he formed his own, and that's what mm. J. E. Rogers did, and that's what uh, Hubert Harrison. We get the writings of Hubert Harrison because we formed our own instead of constantly begging them 
to uh, accept us. We have to form our own. This is what you're doing with Luke Mon Nation. Mm. You're creating your own channel. You're recording it. It's going into prosperity, posterity. Um, we're going to be writing about it. We should reference it. We have conversations that we can't have on mainstream media because it's too black or too fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. We can have it here. Mm -hmm. uh, we can quote it here. We can be basis for progress. It can be basis for mm -hmm. knowing how to look at something. And in the video form, we can watch it at our convenience. We don't have to go to the yeah. library. It's not like a newspaper. If you miss it, there's no more paper copies forever. Mm -hmm. No, we can always access it. So they gave us great opportunities. They gave us a blueprint. I think, you know, I know Abdus and Jackie, you're sympathetic to myself to the Cuban revolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they're very, they're very informed on the way, on the breadcrumbs that was left before them. Garvey mm. and Harrison left a huge breadcrumb oh my for our liberation. You know, Jeffrey Perry is part of that breadcrumb, you know. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm just sitting here like thinking of all of the conversations that you and I have had right. about these issues that we have had with you, Ron, you know, in the church parking lot before COVID, after the liberation, uh, 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 liberation yeah, exactly. college classes, um, after, after church. Yeah. And, and by the way, y'all, yes, we are all believers in yeah. Jesus Christ up in here today. So I, I, if if you have a problem with people of faith, this really ought to dispel all of that for you. Some of us, quite a few of us, do have quite a bit of revolutionary sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, you know the the conversations we have on Black Power Media, right. um, the conversations we just had this morning on the Free Prince Morning Show about Oprah and these and and Tyler Perry and the 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 entertainment industry being the gatekeepers for black yes. culture and That's you Harrison always bashed against that gate. And yes. Always, these right. are the gatekeepers. Yes. This is their name. This is the gate they're keeping. This is who who's paying them to keep the gate. And mm -hmm. look, it don't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. And it and have how to they, stay this way all the time. Yes. And mind. how they even use other African people from yeah. around the diaspora against us in this whole this is just, amazing. You know, funny because that you said that because we were just talking the other day about the whole Hollywood debate between the black British actors and, uh, uh, you know, versus the American black actors. Which stuff. is something that's ginned up right, by the right. very it system it is that ginned keeps, up. it's yep. not. So, I mean, that that's why I think it is important that we understand. And, and I, I know that we always tell people, look, you've got to read, you've got to read. And, and we live in an age where people want microwave information because everything is on the internet. and <laughs> You can just pull it up right there, but there is some stuff that you're not going to get um, unless it comes in a book. And there's some deeper truths and nuance and context that you are not going to get unless you read one book and then go to the bibliography yes. and read all those books. <laughs> I mean, and, and this is, I think, a, a, a great example of why reading the exercise of reading is revolutionary because it changes your worldview it changes your perspective on what is right now based on what people in 1912 put down on paper and like you said Rome gave us the blueprint but let me, okay let I, I gotta ask you about Edgar M gray okay it was this like um I felt like reading this is is Perry serious in terms, he said he had a sentence that said Edgar Gray became the secretary of the Liberty League. Li the Liberty League was Harrison's organization before Garvey founded the UNIA. And I was like, does he not know, this is in 1922, does he not know, Harrison not know that Gray was a paid informant by this time in 1922? Because I read the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey and what Garvey said is that before 22, Edgar Gray was posing as a UNIA and wow. was a paid informant. And he was paid, Garvey said, who paid him was um, the district attorney, um, Kilroe. And then to read him again, I'm like, come on. And then what happened later, Jackie and Abduce, is I realized that Jeffrey Perry did reveal that Gray was not who he cut out to be because he includes a diary entry of um, Harrison saying in his diary at a meeting of the Liberty League, this was in 1924, 
at the meeting of the Liberty League, he's writing in his diary, Harrison writes, Gray raised an objection to a proposal that the Liberty League brought to the table. I have since removed him from the organization. And I was like, yes, <laughs> because you got it. He got it. But I wanted, what I really wanted was, was Perry to take a more authoritative, author, I wanted his critique of conformance to be more authoritarian, mm -hmm. you know, to get him out there, to say, right, know, right. this guy has, I was hoping he would identify Gray as somebody who Garvey already identified as an informant. And, you know, in this time of the popularity of the film, Judas and the Black Messiah, mm -hmm. um, the whole film shows the perspective of William, o well, most of it, half of it shows William O'Neill, who was an mm -hmm. informant who the government paid right. to um, murder Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there's some dovetails, there's some conversations that that film is really having with Hubert Harrison to show the reader, us, who care about Black organizations thriving, we have to be aware. And I believe, because we believe in spirit, because I believe in Christ, I believe Jesus will tell me when somebody's an informant. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Garvey was a believer. Mm -hmm. And Garvey was clear in his relationship with Christ, with his relationship with God, because he's very vocal about his relationship with God, that um, God told him, who was the informant, and he's gonna write this and that and this and that, and part of what he will write is, this person was an informant. And he, Gar Garvey's not writing it to make himself a hero. He's writing it to teach us, you know, the way that other civilizations use their previous histories to learn from those mistakes and to know how to identify an informant who acts like he's all gung ho with the organization, but when you leave, like when you're not in his presence, like William O'Neill left Fred Hampton's presence, he's informing the government everything, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. telling them everything that you're doing. So Edgar Gray, I was hoping you know Perry would pick it up, but I yeah. think Perry redeems himself when he tells us that Harrison removed Gray from his organization. So mm -hmm. what's, what, what do we know about Gray? I mean, uh -huh. without, where is he from? What, I mean, how did he, is there any information on him? I, I know where, what books I read him in, uh, The Philosophy and Opinions. He just names, he, may, he names them on one page. Tony right. Martin, I was looking in the index of Tony Martin's Race First. Gray is not in the index of Race First, which is the long detailed biography of Garvey but he's mentioned in the philosophy and opinions and in he is in perry's index mm -hmm. um very interesting character one who i would assume is also like william o'neill a black man mm -hmm. um, but as we all know this is what makes you know white supremacist society white supremacist society you starve most of the black people and then when they end up many of them in the criminal justice system um, in order to um, get out, they have to take a plea bargain, which is for men, some of them includes becoming an informant. This is the consequence of the giant prison industrial complex mm -hmm. that you could definitely say Edgar Gray was part of. Um, another one, Richard Warren, was another informant that Garvey said informed against him. Warren was not mentioned in the biography, but Gray, uh, Warren, William O'Neill, uh, um, Gene Roberts, Gene Roberts, who informed, who was a um, homosexual informant, um, and the FBI used that. They said, if you don't inform, we're going to um, publicize your sexuality, your homosexuality. And, um, and what year was that to give people context to, to, so people can understand why that's important? 63. My friend Marcus Gardley wrote an incredible play called Betty Shabazz or the Nation. Betty Shabazz semicolon or the Nation. And it's basically mm -hmm. the last part of Marcus Gardley's, not Garvey, Gardley, G A R D L E Y, is Gene Roberts explaining to the audience and to the NOI um, why he did what he did or not him explaining, but just him dealing with giving the government and the NOI 
information about everything Malcolm's doing. Um, and, and that's a classic example for me as a homosexual man of how the government uses race. They can use a black person. The government uses sexuality. They can use a homosexual to inveigle and to basically undermine black organizations. Exactly. And we have to be aware of that. Um, again, knowing our history about the informants, but that's a good question. We, uh, Abdus, we, we only get his names, but I think maybe this might be an opportunity for future researchers well, to do their homework on Edgar Gray. Well, that's what, well, the reason why I brought it up, uh, 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 Dr. Rage, is because we, doing the, preparing for this, we actually was trying to research him, and there's nothing on him. There, there's nothing. Right. I yeah. think the only thing that we that we found on him was a brief mention on an article that was called um, The Rise of the Caribbean Black Caribbean Politicians, and was between 1915 and 1925. Mm -hmm. And he was briefly mentioned in one sentence there. But outside of that, there was nothing. And, and my frustration, Jackie, see my frustration. I said, there's nothing on this guy. You know? <laughs> so, but um, but I wanted to go to, on to something else. Okay. Um, uh, it was one one of the things that let me look here on my notes. Um, I think uh, okay. Well, yeah, we covered that. I, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> what are you trying yeah. to get to? Um, let's see. So we uh, yeah. So so. Talk a little bit about the Liberty okay. League. Sure. Because, we, you know, like I said, we didn't know anything about Hubert Harrison. No, I didn't before know Before we about him. started working with Dr. Sharice burton right, Stelly, and right. she yes. talked about it, talked about him and her work on this book in particular. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, I learned that there's this organization that UNIA is modeled after. Right. So, so tell us about the Liberty League and the connection to the UNIA and what happened to the Liberty League? Sure. Um, the Liberty League, a lot of the model of it, as I mentioned, and as Perry writes, um, was what Garvey learned from. But he was actually doing a lot of what the um, UNIA, he was working, he started the UNI in Jamaica. But what he saw Harrison do with the Liberty League, the Liberty League had three basic elements. Um, first, it had an organization that met regularly. It had a newspaper which was called the voice and harrison's newspaper was the voice and it also had a strong anti-lynching campaign um mm. it had a strong anti-lynching campaign they perry writes that the liberty league petitioned the government to properly enforce the 13th 14th and 15th wow. amendments that it wasn't wow. enforcing in the south and so Garvey witnesses this, but as I mentioned, and a lot of the documentation of the commercial success has been lost, but I think Tony Martin has done the best job of preserving it and documenting it. As Perry writes, um, Marcus Garvey would take that model of, he would already have the organization because he founded it in Jamaica but he would take the model of Harrison, which was an organization, an organization that ran a newspaper and an organization that had a very fierce, not so much anti-lynching campaign, but basically a nationalist campaign, mm. um, the UNIA. And it was very intent on creating chapters. Mary Rollinson in her book, Grassroots Garveyism, Tony Martin has documented the hundreds of UNIA chapters across the country. Mm -hmm. The most UNIA chapters in the Caribbean was in Cuba. Um, really? Yes, it was a lot between Ooh. 1920 and 1940. And this is why Castro is so serious about respecting Marcus Garvey. Um, and also a point that Perry makes in the biography is that the UNIA did not make headway in Jamaica. And that's simply not true. It made a lot of headway in Jamaica. Um, he spoke to sold out audiences when he returned in 1927. Uh, but um, to your question, what Garvey copied from the Liberty League is um, organizational skill, um, not completely, because Garvey knew how to commercially make it successful. 
Why? Because Garvey learned how to be a printer in Kingston mm -hmm. and in Panama. And his knowledge of printing um, made him establish connections with key people who could distribute the paper. Um, mm -hmm. Not only did he know how to print, he knew how to contact ship owners and he knew how to establish relationships with them and he knew how to pay them and he knew how to take his money that he got from the people who were buying the negro world to give to the shippers to buy the ships and so he had a huge command that rivaled hubert harrison um, so he was able to make a great commercial success out of that three model another thing last thing that garvey took um harrison writes from from Harrison, not Harrison, but Perry writes from Harrison. Harrison also does write that Garvey took from him is the tricolor flag. I believe the colors of the Liberty League were brown, yellow, and white. And Garvey just took that model, Perry writes, and changes the colors to the colors of red, black, and green. Wow. So in many ways, he, um, he took the model, and this is so typical of astrological operators, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Garvey is an astrological operator. What I mean by that, his sun sign is Leo. And Leo specialized not so much in originating, but in perfecting performance. Mm -hmm. and Garvey in his lifetime, absolutely. As, as did Castro, perfected the performance of how to make a newspaper profitable. He perfected it. Wow. He was really born to do it. Um, right. And it's powerful to see. And I, I don't want to regret him or say that Harrison hated him, but I think Harrison was jealous that Garvey could perform um, the commercial success of a newspaper in 1920 mm -hmm. so well, um, mm -hmm. make it popular. Mm -hmm. And I think his belief, his faith too, Garvey's faith. Harrison was an agnostic, which means he never um, denied nor admitted the presence of God in his mm -hmm. life. And I think Garvey's belief in God helped him reach that commercial plateau that nobody else could reach. Right, especially with black people. Mm. You know. Yeah, especially, yeah. you're right. Yeah. I think especially with black people who a whole lot of us are, yeah. where are we? In the church. But, especially since, just real quick, yeah, yeah. if you, during that period of time, if you see the growth of the UNIA, most UNIA chapters in this country were actually in a whole bunch of churches. Right. Right. They were actually in a lot of churches. So that I think that connection is very important to make. But you uh, well, no, what I was going to say was um, it was it was um, interesting that you mentioned about Garvey's reception um, in 1927, yes. because, I mean, you know, in my studying of Garvey, which is nowhere as extensive as yours, but it's always that narrative that he was rejected totally in, in um, Jamaica. That, you know, um, I remember watching one so-called documentary where they actually showed Jamaican kids throwing rocks at yes, him. Yes, that's like, Stanley Nelson. Yeah. Do you remember how that's problematic that's his that's documentary it. was of the Panthers? His documentary right. is problematic about Garvey, too. And oh. that same bourgeois lens. You see right. it in, wow. in his film about the Panthers. And, you, yeah, that's not true. Thank you, Abdus, for bringing that up. Because I remember oh. that part. And my parents... I was watching it with my parents, that part that you mentioned, and I remember of all the parts in Stanley Nelson's film about Garvey, that part mm -hmm. I remember the most that you said, Abdus, when the kids mm -hmm. were throwing rocks at him. I'm like, um, Oh, that hurt me too. I, wasn't even, I, I didn't even claim myself to be a Garveyite, but I was just studying it and it, and it really tore my heart. Yeah, like, you know? it was not true. It was <laughs> not, it's disingenuous. It's not Wow, true. I am so glad to know not that. Not true, yeah, Stanley Nelson, he did. He also disrespected Huey Newton in his film on yeah. on the Panthers, and he disrespected yeah. Garvey. And that's why, if you ever read Dr. Julius's Garvey's response to Stanley Nelson's film, woo, oh, that's what let me know. Like when I first, I'll be honest with you, Abdus. When I first read Dr. Julius Garvey's response, I thought he was too harsh. But mm. now that I've lived long and studied the Garvey, I'm like, <laughs> you're like, no, he was not harsh. harsh at, he was spot. He on. needed some more smoke. <laughs> now, now this is another thing. I, I, now I want to jump back to um, because um, you mentioned something about um, the commercial success. Yes, and I remember um, reading somewhere where um, his inner circle was given uh, Garvey's inner circle was giving him a lot of problems. I mean, so much so where. 
um, and, and help me with this if I got it wrong, Dr. Frazier, but where he um, would send people out like to buy the boats and stuff and they would come back with um, inferior, you know, ships or, you know, a lot of money was being lost. This, this is the narrative that's being told. Yes. Um, there was a lot of wasted money yes. um, um, that that his inner circle was giving him such a hard time that Garvey himself pulled guns out on people. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, so could you could you like put some duct tape on all that and yeah. bring it together for us? Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, this, I mean, let me clarify this. Was this part of this whole? Um, because I, I personally, I don't believe that it was um, uh, accidental that these people were giving him such a hard time. So, was this part of this overall, you know, effort to discredit him? Yes, it was. And oh, as wow. Harrison said, part of the fault is Garvey's. His trusting the wrong people. Mm. Um, mm. That was part of his ego mania. He's a Leo man. <laughs> Sometimes that <laughs> ego take over, not, not, and I'm just saying, not just true for Leo, but that they, their reputation, at least for me, the ego maniacal disbelief. One thing that Perry misses is the concerted attack by Cyril Briggs I mentioned earlier. He had a whole vendetta, and I, I was sad to see how um, Cyril Briggs um, was just personally invested in destroying Garvey, and he did. But Garvey retaliated, you know, like you said, he took out a gun on somebody that he believed. Um, because remember that incident with George Tyler, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it was somebody with a gun who was trying mm -hmm. to kill him. So he had to defend himself. And I think um, we might have the elements for a very interesting film on Garvey's life, um, as long as the person does their homework properly. But I, I prefer a stage play to a film. But anyway, it has, yeah, I, I would too. It has the elements to a, but to your question, yes. But part of it, Abdus, is Garvey making wrong decisions and trusting people who had no expertise. So I think mm. he needed help in ways. But I want to say something that I mentioned in my IG video yesterday. And that is something that Amy Ashwood said when Gil Noble interviewed her. Okay. in the early 60s mm -hmm. and she said garvey everything that happened to garvey happened right on time mm -hmm. and it was because of his personality yes in part also his failure was not only his personality his failure was his enemies trying to undermine him and in succeeding him but like i was saying we thank God, I thank God for Amy Jacques Garvey, his second wife, documenting mm -hmm. his philosophy and documenting how um, the UNIA died. Because in documenting how it died, it once again provides a blueprint. So your question, Abdus, is really getting to that. Like, he, there were elements around him that was threatening. And I'm thinking immediately now of Umar Johnson. Yes. Talking to the Breakfast Club about the failure of, or not the failure, about his school. Because I don't, mm -hmm. I do, I personally in my heart, I do not want his school to fail. However, I see already, I'm sure if you haven't already noticed, his personality, you yes. know, his opining on certain things yes. unrelated to Black liberation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but he is real. Nothing to do is with he a real liberation. Though? Uh, but he wants to put his mouth on it, right? Mm -hmm. And that reflects a kind of personality that's like, okay, is this how long is this gonna last? So just yeah, focus, yeah. putting the head down, um, and just focusing mm -hmm. rather than um, getting caught up in, as you mentioned, Abdus, the distractions that Garvey got caught up in. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that Harrison also said. Harrison was also right in his. Um, tendency, Garvey's tendency to be flamboyant, too flamboyant. Mm. Um, but in my mind, his desire for flamboyance doesn't, com com doesn't compare to the example of financial freedom. Right. He demonstrated to so many people, including Malcolm X's father and Malcolm X himself and Ho Chi Minh and Fidel Castro. Mm. You, know, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I think I can't think about Especially being a, a native of New Jersey, yes. I can't help but think about um, the more more uh, Americans, uh, Noble Ju Ali, um, uh, the Nation of Islam. 
I mean, all the these, oh, right, right. I mean, um, and even on the Christian side, I mean, Father Divine and a whole lot of them that all gained their inspiration um, from Garveyism and, and from that blueprint you talked about, um, which I mean, I mean, what you said about his second wife really um, uh, documenting his his philosophy and having that blueprint. Jack and I did a show, um, I think maybe a year ago, where we were discussing the same thing. We were like, here we are trying to reinvent the wheel, and the blueprint is already there. It oh is. God. It is. It's already, it's it's already is. there. It's already there. Yep. It's already there. Mm -hmm. We don't have to <laughs> contort ourselves. And it's, it's a matter of uniting, doing what you're doing with this platform mm. about it, talking about it. Don't we see what Garvey is saying about the Negro intellectuals that the white capitalists have de designated then? Don't we see the same thing today? Right. Don't we exactly. know who the Negro intellectuals of today are? We don't need to name them. And so how are we going to respond? Because now that we've seen this has happened, now we have to learn with the knowledge. We have to apply it properly. Wow. Mm. We have to apply yeah. it properly. So, you know, the fi final question, I think this is this this points to exactly kind of where we are in in our struggle for liberation, because while, you know, I, too, am very thankful for um, Jeffrey Perry and his uh, uh, biographies of a, an intellectual and radical giant. Yes. And I love to bring up the fact that Hubert Harrison was an autodidact. Yes. He was, and I didn't even know what that word meant. I still don't know what that <laughs> until means. It means he was self-taught, just oh, like us. Okay, see, I learned <laughs> he everything. Was, he was, he was self-taught. So mm -hmm. the the that that I think is the 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 beauty and the power of love of your people and love of knowledge and uh, the the humility that you're never going to stop learning you can always learn from someone else and even with his with his human weaknesses his jealousies and whatever else that uh, uh you know caused the rift between him and Marcus Garvey yes. Marcus Garvey we have him as an example because of Hubert Harrison. Because of Hubert Harrison. You're right. And, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there about Hubert Harrison's connection to the Harlem Renaissance. And, and you know, just, we, we may have to do another one of these. Because oh, there's yes, so we much yeah, we more do. of that. So much. Yeah. But th this is the question, I think, that is very important to me, at least. The way UNIA is uh, framed in the book um, in the biography, where it's not members of UNIA who are talking about the organization. Who's giving the information on UNIA in, in this biography, and why is that important, especially since we are looking back on the legacy of Hubert Harrison and how important he is to Garvey and everything else that, that we have to do right now? Definitely. Who's giving the information is government agents. And they mm -hmm. had an agenda, which is to find something that will make Garvey a criminal. So it's it's a bent. It's similar to what the government agent in Judas and the Black Messiah told William O'Neill, the informant. He said, the Klan is as bad as this Black Party, Black Panther Party group. They're hate groups. So that's why we have to question the UNIA narrative. The UNIA, like the Black Panther Party, fed people. The UNIA was responsible for educating people. The UNIA inspired Elijah Muhammad. The UNIA allowed a space where one can see a debate, you know. So um, a lot of how Perry describes the UNIA is really like this group that is mindless and is unable to think without Garvey and will kill anybody at the drop of a hat on behalf of Garvey. And in response, um, I say that that is not the correct image of the UNIA. Um, they were very serious about self-defense and they had reason because their leader um, was going to be um, almost assassinated under the aegis of the New York district attorney. So they defended just the way that any group would want its leader 
for example, for another example, Cubans would want their leader Castro defended and they successfully defended him against, I don't know how many assassination attempts from the CIA. Mm -hmm. yeah. So any group will defend its leader. And I, I took every sense about the UNIA being wild, crazy, fanatic over Garvey with a grain of salt and understood, okay, he is taking Harrison's, he is sympathetic to Harrison's perspective. So he is describing the UNIA the way Harrison would, not the way I would. But we still should know about this because similar thing happens today in, in terms of the way I see, and you've talked about on your show, FBA. Right. and the uh, Foundation of Black Americans, the way they dismiss Cynthia Erivo's interpretation of Harriet Tubman, the yeah. way they dismiss certain things because it's of a group that they think is fundamentally separate, different from their group. You know, the exclusionary ways. Um, right. So mm -hmm. Perry was kind of doing that trick where he wanted the reader to exclude the way Harrison chose to um, separate himself from the UNIA. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we're definitely going to do one of these things again. But, uh, but when you were talking about so um, Dr. Frazier, I don't know, but um, uh, when you were talking about how we have to, to confront these narratives. Yes. Now, Jackie and I, and I'm, I'm going to bring it up again, <laughs> um, the Candace Owens, man, and, and the rest <laughs> of You know, and I think that, all right, I'll, I'll let you explain this. Yes. How dangerous is, uh, I mean, how, 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 how important is it in this age of social media now? Because we're not dealing with newspapers anymore. We're not yeah. dealing, we're dealing with faster information fast and, and faster um, narratives being created and told. So what, you know, how, how, how much more important it is for us to, um, to confront these, um, these false narratives. It, from, from it's, people so, that like it's so important. If anything, Garvey, and Harrison teaches, Garvey did this too. And in fact, one thing I wanna say on this video, I think Garvey had a more sophisticated understanding of neocolonialism than Harrison. And the reason I say that is because Harrison in one of the Negro World articles talked about, he, he could, when the US colonized the Virgin Islands, which is um, the island chain that he is from St. Croix, which is one of the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. he says a comment in 1920 that, putting the U.S. putting natives in charge of the island is a good idea. Well, I read that. I was like, whoa, I totally missed that he said that. Wow. Because later he totally denounces the U.S. naval occupation of St. Croix and the rest of the Virgin Islands. Totally denounces it. Because he sees that the natives are paid by the U.S. naval occupation to be more mm. brutal mm. than the um, white um, governors, than the white leaders of, of, of the naval occupation. Garvey by 1911, by the time he was, I would say, before he even turned 25, Garvey was clear about how um, U.S. imperialism requires some use of natives, but in a very, very um, um, tragic way, where, as James Baldwin said about Harlem, the black cop is worse than the white cop mm -hmm. because they have more to prove. Right. Baldwin was on that. Garvey was on that level that Baldwin was at early. He said the colored class is worse in Jamaica because oh. they have more to prove to Downing Street, London, who give right. them money. Are you going to get more money? So I say that to say. Um, I say that to say about your question. Remind me your question of. Again, about the about the importance of of, of confronting these false narratives in the social media age. Social media age. So, Garvey, because Garvey was more thank you, Abdus, because Garvey mm -hmm. was more sophisticated than Harrison on neocolonialism, he'll be able to tell you the capitalist owner. And so, to your question, Abdus, find who the capitalist owner, because you'll find one, black or white, they're the ones that are making. Candace Owens' voice so big. They're the ones that are making Tariq Nasheed's voice so big. Right. They're the ones that are making a few other voices who I don't want to say so yeah. big. Get to them and find out what's their incentive for pain because there's the real dialogue in order to preserve, you know, 
white, a white supremacist society. As long as you have the races fighting each other, um, white supremacist economy will always thrive. But mm -hmm. if you start to see it's a class war, which is what Garvey was more serious about meeting with Edward Clark, as was Malcolm X, because people dog Garvey for meeting um, with the Grand Wizard of the Klan, but they don't dog Malcolm for meeting with Rockwell, the head of the American Nazi yes, Party. He did. Or, or, you know, or Elijah because Muhammad. Because they understood it's a class war. Right, right. Elijah but, Muhammad met with the Klan. Exactly, get to the <laughs> root of who all these Candace Owens study who pays her. Okay, mm -hmm. that's yep. that's how you avoid it, and of course, mm -hmm. that's you gotta have to do your research. They're not gonna tell you, oh, such and such pays them. Mm -hmm. You find out. You find mm -hmm. out. Follow the money. Follow right. the money. Like right. Harrison said, show me whose bread you eat, and I'll tell you whose song you sing. Garvey and Harrison were dedicated to exposing, mm -hmm. showing um, whose bread people were eating. Wow, that is so. Uh, that is mm -hmm. so bad. First of all, before we end for the night. I want to apologize to all of the Leos out there because I said something about uh, Umar, Ricky Ryan. I am so sorry. Forgive me. Uh, I love the Leos. And for all the Leos out there, let me let me make it clear on the cipher. Umar Johnson, Dr. Umar Johnson is not a Leo. I thought he was. <laughs> no, he's a Vir uh, Virgo. I thought Umar I thought Johnson was, was Leo. Yeah. <laughs> he's a Virgo. I'm sorry. I love yeah. Leo and I love Virgo. I don't want to insult Leo men or Virgo men. I hope that right, right. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's just he, he, oh, it's, it's, it's just that nobody wants to, Mar Johnson. That's that nobody wants to claim him. Yeah. No zodiac wants to. No, no sign wants to claim that man while he's acting a fool, and he's been acting a fool for a man. Not, not even a Gemini. I know, and y'all are yeah. anyway. <laughs> 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 Listen. Ron, Dr. Frazier, we appreciate, appreciate this you. talk yeah. so much. And you got to come over. Look, look, look. Yeah. We got our shots, man. And, and look, don't judge us. We got our shots. We got yeah. our shots. So, I mean, so we vaccinated. You got to come over to the bunker for dinner, man. <laughs> yes, you got to come over for dinner. That. Yeah. And we, yeah, yeah. We, we have got to have part two, three, yeah. four, five, because Hubert Harrison oh. is a towering giant. Yes. And I, if you call yourself a black nationalist in this country, you stand on that man's shoulders. And, and it's amazing. Just the stuff, just the little bit that we got tonight has been an, an incredible meal. And so... Yes, definitely get that book. Um, we, we got right into this, so we didn't even read uh, Roan's uh, bi <laughs> biography. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We got to do that. But we, we do need to do that. And let, wait, let me, let me hope before we go, uh, because this, this is important. We, okay. we need to um, let people know that, listen, it's not that we are particularly smart or, you know, all that. Um, uh, special ourselves. We just hang around people who are doing, who are amazing people and who do amazing, amazing work. So Rome Frazier, if you didn't know, is an independent scholar and taught on the faculty of Temple, Princeton, and Howard Universities. He's the author of, this is a book for you to get, Pauline Hopkins and Advocacy Journalism, which is a literary criticism of the four historical novels written by self-published journalist, Pauline Hopkins. Mm -hmm. He's the co-editor of Critical Responses about the Black Family in Toni Morrison's God Help the Child. He edited a special collection on the meaning of the fiction of novelist Elizabeth Nunez, and he published an article about Marlon James's novel entitled A Brief History of Seven Killings. Mm -hmm. And he's currently working on an edited collection about the scholarship of Dr. Toni Martin, who is the editor of of the Marcus Garvey Library. So we rock with people who know their right. shit. And I wanted to say this too, <laughs> if you ever write, cause I'm a playwright too. Yes. If you ever, yes. I mean, I wrote a, my first play I wrote when I was like in middle school and, and I had a drama teacher uh, go take my play out to California and I ain't seen it since. So I'm sure it's been put on somewhere. But um, anyway, um, what I was gonna say, if you ever write a play about Marcus Garvey, 
Let me know because I want Ooh. to audition for that. Let me tell you, you know, I, where it's come I, would from? To, I would love to be a part of that. Thank you. You, you know, parading right around the house in the whole uniform. Oh, I don't want to be Marcus Garvey. Oh, okay. But I would, I would love to audition uh, for something there. <laughs> There's a part of Marcus Garvey's life that I always think about, and that is the time in London. So, mm. yeah, that time in London was special because I feel the pain of him having to separate himself from. And so this is where Stanley Nelson was right, except he was wrong in showing that that was only what Jamaicans thought. He was right in that he did leave Jamaica because the government made it hard for him, not the people, right. not the people, mm. the government. And so him forcing himself to be estranged, I think is a conversation that, woo, I feel needs to be explained and understood. Mm -hmm. Why he left Jamaica for England. And um, yeah, I'll say that, yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's a whole just, interesting story about what- That, that is a story that, that's that often is. not told off. That's not told often either. It is. So, yeah. I mean, listen, again, Dr. Frazier, thank you so, so very much <laughs> for this amazing You're discussion. Welcome. Um, everyone in the chat has been well, let, uh, let really out. enjoying. Really? Yeah. I, we listen, we didn't even share a whole lot of comments because everybody was just yeah. listening and, and soaking it all yeah. up. And uh, yeah, so let's shout out Ricky Ryan Hi, Ricky. Ryan in the chat. And she said that she remembers that you came to her book club. Yes, about um, Jamaica Kincaid. Uh -huh. place. I love that she read that book. Yep. I love we had, we had that conversation. That was awesome. Yes. And yeah. I don't know if you can Thank see you. the comment on the screen there. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you for the yeah. compliment. It means so much coming from such a committed reader and analyzer of what you she read. Yeah, absolutely she absolutely is. is. I'd love to she talk to Ricky about is. any book. Any and, book you read, and, please and tell me, Ricky, so I can read it and talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, this is from Deborah Rodriguez. Thank you. Hey, Debbie. I appreciate it, Deborah. Thank you. And we've got Phil Winter in the chat, John Kester. Oh, sorry. Let me pull this down. Um, Red Legend. We did have people who were engaging in this discussion, um, that just throwing out facts about Garvey, yeah. just adding to George the discussion. McGuire. Red Legend. Yeah. Yeah. George McGuire started the African Orthodox Church. I believe that's who also influenced uh, Albert Clegg. Yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we just got his book. We did. Yeah. We did just get his book. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. The amazing. Message to the yeah. grassroots. Malcolm X. Yes. Mm -hmm. To the yep. speech. Powerful. So Thank you for telling us about George McGuire being moved by Garvey. Yep. David uh, Silberg in the chat. And he said uh, this is what he had to say. Thank you. Oh, yes. It's always mm -hmm. both and. It's never either or. We can walk mm -hmm. and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. yes, we can. So thank you, Jeffrey Perry. Thank you, Jeffrey we Perry. We absolutely for can. Do donating, your, giving your life to educating us on who Harrington is. You didn't just, and I want to thank Jeffrey Perry for not just taking the diary, but taking mm -hmm. a diary and writing the story. You know, right. some people can't get that far. They just get the diary and we don't get the story. But Jeffrey exactly. was able to right. tell the story. Thank you, Jeffrey Perry. For mm -hmm. telling the story, uh, we have um, who is that? Emmanuel Kitzo. Oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, what did Emmanuel say? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's mm -hmm. what John Henry Clark said. Everything. Yeah. And, and Tony Martin mm -hmm. says the same thing. Emmanuel says here: bits and pieces from the Garvey movement. Bits and pieces. Alain Locke took bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, certain others after him took bits and pieces of what Garvey did. And the ACP wow. got the whole idea of marching from the UNIA. Um, you know, yeah. uh, the banner, hanging the banner. Uh, they wouldn't do street demonstrations, and that's something that the first wife was more vehement about than the second wife. Um, for street demonstrations, which the NAACP did. But John Henry Clark has said something so similar to what Emmanuel said: they take our culture and give it back to us. We see this especially in the music. Mm -hmm. um, the music from the Rastas, particularly Peter Tosh, legalize it. It's taken in such a different context now. Wow. It's used as, it's used as a crutch. You know, marijuana I see is used as a crutch instead of motivation right. um, mm. for liberation and oh, to be on that. Thing. Yeah, that's, that's music, the, the music industry, that is especially true in the music industry, Emmanuel. Yes. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. our culture is taken 
and sold back to us and we have to pay for it. Right, right, right. that's right. Um, so we have, um, oh, I wanted to shout out to Black mm -hmm. um, with the Black Myth Podcast. Right. Uh, that's on Black Power Media. Right. And uh, our girl, Karena Akri Payette. Right, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Karena, um, I appreciate the compliment. With Tele Jaguar. Please yep. check out Tele Jaguar on Facebook, y'all. Yeah, she's coming back to the show, too. Yes. And uh, also, look, Ajamu. Ajamu Baraka was <laughs> in the building. Yeah, he was in the building. I and, don't know if he's still there, but he, he oh, was in I, the I, building. I, I got to shout my man out in myth. Prince Johnson. Beautiful. Man, my brother in myth. I mean, my so brother in arms in myth. Yep. So listen, this this has been a beautiful discussion, Ron. Thank you again. This will not be the last of these discussions. And we really, really appreciate your scholarship and your passion yes. um, and, and your spirit. Your spirit is just amazing. And we love you and we appreciate you I so much. I love you too. Yeah. And my birthday, we have my birthday dinner, which is, I'm a Gemini, so my birthday is okay. next month. And you're coming over for my birthday dinner, bro. Okay. Thank I you. Just, yeah. I so just that's that's right <laughs> Thank you. I'll make sure I get vaccinated by then. Now I really have to get vaccinated. Okay, uh, cool. Well, look, look. Uh, who cares? But just just come just come. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So thank you all, everyone, for joining us here on the Cypher and Luke Mon Nation. We really hope you enjoyed this conversation and appreciated it. Uh, this will probably pop up on Black Power Media. Oh, I'm sure. We share the love. We but, share but, the love. But let me ask you this. Let me say, say this to you. As much as affirmative as it is, you got to admit, this was dangerous. This was. This, this was. This, this, I mean, this, 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 this was. Woo. This is probably the most dangerous podcast going on. We're, I mean, this was some dangerous stuff. This there. was fire. Yep. And listen, we don't know how frequently we're going to do the cipher, <laughs> but trust me, the cipher is not going away because this is what we do here in Luke Mon Nation. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate you. Take care. Peace if you're willing to fight for it. And we've got to fight for it, y'all. Peace. Good night. Good night. Had them all long before I dial up. How they claiming they on top and I'm a mom.